my goal today is simply to give you some thoughts, I hope, to think about design for disassembly and adaptability in current or future projects um, amongst all your many sustainability goals. A little bit about my background in this area and just to note a few things as an architect taking buildings apart, it's impossible not to think about what we might do better in the future. Um, I've also participated in different guides and standards. So for further um, reading and discovery, I would recommend the ISO standard. I was the US representative for developing that. So there is an ISO standard, uh, by the way, for design for disassembly and adaptability. The design for disassembly the built environment guide that Kenley was responsible for um, allowing me to work on, and then books and other resources. Um, as a member of the AI Materials Working Group, we developed a materials pledge, um, which I would also encourage you to look at for the holistic approach towards materials. I was pondering some grand uh, way of describing this and what's important about it, but I didn't really have to because yesterday this came into my inbox. And I think a few things that I'll make a point about, um, a large institutional owner like Amazon having many buildings, leasing buildings, change within their operations, change within their technologies and spatial needs, uh, pretty much writes the story for me. Um, we wouldn't have really thought that data centers would be such a profoundly impactful building type 20 years ago. We of course didn't, maybe 30 years ago, think about climate change and the need for really adaptable resilient structures more and more every day. And I think it's interesting to note just the subtitle. So of course, any firm, many firms are evaluating ways to transform their vacant office space that um, occurred because of COVID and the adaptations that have taken place because of that event. Just a few terms that I think uh, just to kind of highlight and uh, understand. So uh, the term de design for deconstruction gets thrown around. I, I typically use the term design for disassembly and adaptability. It's rather long, but the point is this isn't about cheapening or shortening the lives of buildings. In fact, it's the opposite, which is to extend the lives of buildings. Um, once the building's built, it will endure many changes, many inputs of materials and production of waste from renovation, repairs, replacement. And yes, um, change is ever present. It's not always the quote, fault of the building as the Amazon article notes. Um, there are changes ever present. Buildings exist within society, technology, code, climate, and all of these factors. So um, what we're just trying to do is make buildings last, make the material last. The other important idea is reusability. So we can deconstruct things all day long, but um, without the capacity, the design, the systems, to get them back into use, then there's not much point. So we need that whole system of product supply, design, contractor, everyone involved. And the essential element here is that it's reuse and maintaining its value and function in the highest way possible. So to express this idea, I think, um, that not only what we're talking about is the building's materials of that current present building, but um, everything that went in to make those building materials. So the factor 10 concept was developed by the Wuppertal Institute in Germany in the 90s. And the essential point is on average, about 90% of all renewable, non-renewable materials harvested from nature um, are wasted in the making of a final product. So the other way to say that is only 10% of what's harvested from nature actually ends up in the product. So in order to be sustainable, we need to be 10 times more efficient. And we need to think about 
brings out its material things. And I think term is really appropriate. It's been well used in Europe at this point. We're not saying buildings are materials warehouses, materials barns, materials stores. They are banks. They are literally these essences of natural resources that have been concentrated um, into this, this artifact. And of course, not all products or materials have the same rucksack factor, meaning that overburden of raw resource. So there's a range. And we can certainly think about which products really are becoming more scarce, um, becoming more difficult to obtain for whatever reason, whether it's social issues, political issues, time, distance, and so on. Make it even worse, I would say, um, consider that original building to the entire life cycle of the building. So just to model this idea that over time, your building is not just what it was made of in the beginning. It is an accumulation of particularly services, space plan um, elements over that life. So the waste it's produced in renovation and the additional materials that are placed from renovation and replacement. So the cumulative stock is way more than what was originally um, inputted. And you can see the structure though is the essential building. And so my point is we are also saying that building materials should go out of building and back into the building of the future. And so the building of the future should be a withdrawal from an existing building um, in order to achieve some semblance of carbon neutrality and sustainability. And this is an actual building, the Buckner Company headquarters in North Carolina, and they happen to be a crane company. So they accumulated all these wonderful, interesting materials over time. They don't have a green building rating. They don't have a policy. They don't have anything driving them except the pure common sense of, hey, we have these raw materials that are perfectly acceptable to use to build our headquarters. So some of the factors you might want to consider in doing this are, um, and I'm just trying to simplify this for the sake of this discussion, are the materials that you use durable and will have value over their lives? So again, there's no point in a cheap material for the first use when there's, there's nothing left at 20 year time frame. We need information, we always need information about the the building material, about the products, about its installation. Otherwise, how will we know how to take the building apart effectively? How will we know um, the sort of safety and surety of using that product again? Are the connections accessible, reversible, and non-destructive? If they were destructive, we're not really reusing things. That'd be perfectly fine for crushing something up or melting something down for recycling, but reuse requires the essential integrity of what we've recovered. And are the assemblies um, independent? So the worst issue that I certainly believe is what we would call the entanglement of buildings, where especially MEP and other systems are just a spaghetti of of systems that don't have independence. And so that just causes tremendous problems in recovering the material. So two simple examples. So this is my own house designed and built. I call it the COVID house because 2020, 2021, um, it's sort of aligned to this horrible increase in materials cost. And I would have used reclaimed materials anyway, but here's another reason why you should think about it the sort of instability of materials. Um, I hope it's reasonably obvious. All the siding is reclaimed lumber, the soffits whitewashed reclaimed lumber. I had goals such as daylighting, rainwater harvesting, of course, the use of reclaimed materials. And this did achieve a green building rating um, via the local state green building system. This front component was actually the envelope of the existing building on the site, a 1950 home that the roof was collapsing on. So I deconstructed the entire roof and gutted it 
and left the four walls and the slab to preserve the embodied carbon of the concrete. And so building up from that line. So concepts were designed for assembly. Um, so my next point is in the culture of the place where I am, I could not do everything I wanted. Some costs were prohibitive. Contractors were unfamiliar. And if you kind of went for the platinum or Cadillac version, is that really practical? So I would like to just convey, do whatever you can, whenever you can, wherever you can, for whichever client and purpose that it works. You can see the Gruam beans in the upper left and the sit panels on the roof. So that first kind of principle of long span and independence of structure from everything within. And of course the structural panels are an integral system um, lifted into place. They're screwed down so you could in the future unscrew them and take them off. I use reclaimed lumber so you can see the mix of new and old. Um, and just to point out in the left, so different sizes of reclaimed lumber and I wanted to build a nice robust nine foot six tall wall. We incorporated these sort of offset blocking. If you see the sort of zigzag of the upper and lower blocking, which allowed to use odd lengths of lumber like seven foot six or eight foot two or whatever it was, as long as I could keep it with some shorter offcut piece. And I realized looking at this, it's not mass timber, but it is cramming as much lumber as I possibly could into the building. And then the last point is that is a chase. So instead of drilling through all of the studs for wiring and anything else, thereby um, compromising its future use, this actually had flex duct within the walls. It had wiring within the walls, within that cavity. So I'm preserving those materials in the future. These panels of uh, finished plywood and you can see the screws. So using finished screws, um, is this an aesthetic? Yeah, it's an aesthetic, um, but it actually then the whole wall is an access panel and designing that system to keep whole sheets of plywood as much as possible. Obvious kind of strategy with the exposed ductwork hung from the ceiling. So with a SIP roof, there is no attic anyway. So all the conditioned space, um, duct and conditioned space, you can see the gluams, you can see the plywood. So these are very simple things that are residential scale. Um, I mentioned the roof. So there are no penetrations in the ceiling. All the ducts and vent, sorry, all the vents and um, waste line, waste vents and drain and dryer vents and everything go out the wall. So there are no penetrations in the roof. Well, that's great for water resistance. And again, the entire panel of roofing or SIP is integral. And I retain the drawings. So I have an owner's manual of the drawings of the SIP panels. The other case study I'll just mention, and I did not design this building, Miller Hall did, and I thank Bree for sharing some drawings. And I visited this building quite a few times and I love it um, because it's kind of illustrating the time aspect of architecture. The site, the previous site on the left, the Discovery Center in the middle, site plan and what, at the time that I researched it was proposed for the future. So ironically, the building was built in 1995. So almost 20 years later, it's still there. So a sort of temporary building that actually is still serving the use. And you can see how it's made up of steel bolted together. It's got a sort of plinth elevated um, floor system. So that frees up underneath and you can see the sort of double bent system. So it was assembled and bolted together on site, but these double bents then created this system of modules that in the future, one could disassemble as modules and relocate the building. So we don't have to think of disassembly 
literally to the stick level. Um, it is to whatever the functional level and the highest integrity that we can maintain. And I should note the little bump out um, to the upper right in these drawings is the service core. So it's isolated, separated from the main um, occupied space. And so just to share a few resources, I mentioned the Design for Disassembly Guide, that's King County Guide, the AIA Design for Adaptability Guide. So when I was at the AI Materials Knowledge Working Group, that's a good primer, I would recommend it. Um, the Design for Reuse Guide was another one I participated in with public architecture. So it's a great compendium of uh, different building types that use reclaimed materials. Um, all the way from residential to office to educational. And so I hope all of this will give you a little bit of inspiration to think about in the future. And thank you for your time.